Page. I said they want to give us uh, Brent. Are you ready? I'm ready. <coughs> All right. So I guess you're looking at me. You just talk, right? And okay. If you want to get animated? Great. So you're in the back of the truck. So I'm in the back of the little van, Volkswagen style truck. They've already picked me up out where I was captured, bouncing into the streets of Hanoi. And I can tell I'm in a big city because I can hear shouting and screaming and cars and scooters and all kind of stuff. Anyway, we come to a stop. I have no idea what time it is, but I'm feeling like it's the middle of the night, like midnight or sometime shortly thereafter. And they open the back doors and a couple of guys get around there and point guns at me and tell me, get out. So I get out and I notice the big round Right in front of me is a big round arch to the Hanoi prison. I didn't know it, that, but anyway, it said Walo. And Walo is the real name of the Hanoi Hilton. So they get me out, and at gunpoint, I stumble in to the, through the gate, the doors slam behind me, and they march me down a hallway and then I turned over to some some prison guards and they at gunpoint marched me down the hall a little ways and around the corner and they opened the door and they point me in there and push me up against the wall and sort of throw me on the floor and say they, I don't think they said anything just point I plopped on the floor and leaned against the wall and there I was and I looked around, the, then they sh slammed the door and the wall, the wall of this thing had looked like lumps of plaster had been thrown on it. And later I was to find out the other prisoners had named that, that room the Nobby Room because of the little knobs of plaster. And I sat there for a long time and then I, I was so tired and I nodded off sleep and I heard the door crash open and some guard came in and gave me a belt as long as whacked the side of the head. No sleep, no sleep. Didn't take me long to figure out I was not supposed to be sleeping. I could, <laughs> for the life of me, I couldn't wonder why. So anyway, I sat there for a long time and I was in pretty bad pain. I was, you know, I had a broken arm, I had a rag wrapped around it and I'd been pretty well beat up all day long and blood oozing out of a multitude of small wounds around my arm that wasn't bandaged. And I <laughs> remember thinking to myself, why me, God? <laughs> why me? <laughs> Think of all the other jerks in the squadron. Could have been one of them. Why a good guy like me? <laughs> so anyway, I sat there and saw my self-pity wasn't doing any good. Anyway, eventually, sometime in the middle of the night, the door clanked open and in walked this Vietnamese officer. I didn't know at the time, but he sat at a desk a few feet from me and said, what is your, what's your name? And I told him my name. And he says, where are you from? I says, I can't answer that. Under the Geneva Convention for Treatment of Prisoners of War, the only thing I'm allowed to give you is my name, my rank, and my serial number. And he laughed. He said, ho, ho, ho. We never signed the Geneva Agreement on Treatment of Prisoners of War, and we don't go by those rules. He says, I am busy tonight, but I will return to talk to you later. And you will soon, soon learn to think more clearly, and you will be talking to me. And I noticed one thing. This guy's hand was shaking, and he had a cigarette in his mouth, and he kept puffing on it, and it got shorter and shorter. And finally, he jerked back, and it burned his lip, and he took it and flicked it on the ground. But his hand kept shaking. And I was realizing he wasn't shaking because he was afraid of me. He was shaking because he was so angry. Anyway, he said, I have to leave now. I have many things to do tonight, but I will return to talk to you at a later time. 
and he walked out. Bam! The door crashed behind him, and I said, ah, I've already shown him how tough I am. I told him that I'm only going to tell him my name, my rank, and my serial number because of the Geneva Convention. Ho, ho, ho. I was soon going to learn that that wasn't going to hack it. So anyway, I sat there and I kept dozing off. Every time I dozed off, the door would open and in would come the no sleep guard and whack me in the side of the head. No sleep, no sleep. So I sat there and time went by and I couldn't tell if it was day or late because there were no windows in this cell. So I, I'm assuming it was sometime the next morning and my interrogator, who I had in my mind nicknamed Shaky, came back in and I could, it was late and he looked very tired. He, was, he says, I have been busy during the night talking to other prisoners and now I have some time to talk to you. And he asked me a few more questions and I told him, I said, I told you, I can't tell you any of that. I only can tell you, he said, nah, he said, he, said he, he was calling me my name by then, Nay Smith, but he was having a hard time saying it. Vietnamese have a hard time pronouncing that scrabble of letters. So it came out something like Najmit or Najshit or something like that. And I refused to talk and he said, he shrugged, got up, walked out, shouted at the guards out there, and in came two or three young guards with a bunch of rope in their hands and they threw me around and the next thing I knew I was trundled up like a like a, a cow in a roping movie. You've seen the cowboys when they rope a cow and they tie their legs together and next thing I knew I was all tied up and they tied my two legs, my ankles together and my a rope went over my shoulder and they left my right arm alone because it was broken but they'd grabbed they tied a, my left arm behind my back and rope over my shoulder and, and they were pulling me up and cinching me up and blah, oh my god, I thought I was gonna break in half and bent me over and over and my arm kept going higher and higher and then they left. And I sat there and all tied up like this for, God, it seemed like hours, but it couldn't have been. And they came back in and untied me. I said, whew. I got through that, but then they just untied me and tightened the ropes up even tighter. And I was getting contorted into this tiniest little ball. It was incon inconceivable. And I'm going to show you what happened. My legs were tied together. My left arm was around my back. And the next thing I knew, my left hand was appearing over my right shoulder. And that's impossible, but there it was. And I can't possibly do it now, but here come my left hand coming over my left shoulder tight down to my two ankles. And Shaky came back in. He says, are you ready to talk? I shouted at him, name, rank, and serial number. And he says, he shouted at the guards and they untied me. And I said, ah, ha, I, whew, I got through it. And they just tightened me up tighter. And I was in a pretzel ball. And they left me like that, it, it seemed like for hours, obviously it wasn't. Sometime in the next few hours, some guard came in and untied me. Just un didn't really untie me, but un undid the rope that went from my ankles to my hand. And so I flopped against the wall and tried to doze off. And again, the other guard came in and whacked me in the head. No sleep, no sleep. <clears throat> And this went on in a continuous cycle. It seemed like forever, but it obviously couldn't have been. And the, guy, the Vietnamese guy I'd named Shaky came in and says, are you ready to talk? And I remember saying things like, I'm not talking to you, but I didn't. then I started thinking, these guys aren't messing around. I better start thinking of something to say or these guys are going to kill me because I know from being a Boy Scout, you can't leave a person tied up too tight too long or it'll shut off the circulation to their ankles or their wrists and, and your leg will fall off, your foot will fall off, or your hand will fall off. So I started thinking of lies I could tell this guy to get some relief from being in this tied up little contortionist ball. So sometime later that day, the same shaky guy came in and the guard untied me and, and he says, 
he started asking him questions. So I started making up lies. He said, what is the name of your commander? I said, Colonel Wilson. <clears throat> what unit were you with? Eighth TAC Fighter Squadron. <clears throat> he tied me up, went away, came back again, asked me the same question. I thought, oh, geez, I forgot. I forgot the lie I told him. And he says, you lie, you lie. <clears throat> then I started thinking again, I better start memorizing my lies because Obviously, this guy is, is not going to buy it if I don't get maybe ask the same question two times in two different periods of time and I give a different answer. So the, the guy disappeared. They left me laying on the corner of the cell for hours and hours and I have no idea where he went, but I could hear people screaming outside and there were American voices screaming and I said, oh, now I know where he is. He's busy given the given the works to other people somewhere cl close enough that I can hear him shouting and shrieking. I don't know how long this went on. I, I'm guessing three, four days, series of being tied up, being untied. <clears throat> no water, no food, and, and Shaky came back in sometime, I guess, the second or third day, and he had a cup of water. <clears throat> and he says, you want water? I said, yes, I need water. I was, I was so dehydrated, I was choking to death. So he took the cup of water and threw it in my face. He says, there's your water. And he, he kept shaking his finger at me, and, and I, he mentioned, you here, you hear the noises of your friends. They have learned to think clearly. They are giving me truthful answers. Now, of course, I couldn't hear what they're saying. I just hear them shouting and yelling. <clears throat> so I have no idea what was really happening, but I, I knew that at least I wasn't alone in this situation and that other guys were saying more than just name, rank, and serial number. So I spent a lot as much time as my poor little pain-sodden brain could, <clears throat> could uh, and I started working up stories of fictitious, fictitious stories, but at least stories. So I memorized a set of things that I was going to tell him and tried my best to remember so if he asked again, I didn't screw it up and get my ropes tightened up again because I had obviously told another lie. Again, somebody came in, they gave me a cup of water, and they had to feed it to me because my left hand didn't work. And I said, oh, Jesus, now they left me dead up so long that this thing's gonna fall off. I'm gonna die of gangrene, but it was just, I'm not sure what it was. It wasn't working, so this guard <coughs> jammed this cup in my mouth and I choked down as much water as I possibly could. I told the guard I had to pee because I felt like I had to urinate as bad as I've ever in my life and he just shook his head and I said, well, then I'm going to have to pee right here on the floor. So he went out and shouted at somebody and finally the, the guard, they helped me up because I couldn't walk. I hobbled outside to pee and I <laughs> pulled out my penis with the greatest urge to pee that I've ever had in my life and a little orange glob of very dehydrated urine came out. I didn't have any water in there to leak out, but I felt like I was going to pee a gallon and I peed about 13 drops of bright, bright yellow, thick liquid. Back inside, back against the wall, no sleep, slap, slap. This went on for days and days, and it seemed like for, for weeks. And in the meantime, this wounded arm was getting larger. And the rag that was around it was getting red and was leaking something inside. And I thought, oh, Jesus, now I've got gangrene. I'm a goner. So I kept, every time Shaky would come in, I would. I, he says, yes, you need medical attention. You tell us what we want to know, and you will be taken to see the doctors. 
He said, but unless you tell me the truth to the questions I ask you, no doctor. So I was thinking to myself, the dirty so-and-sos are blackmailing to see a, a doctor unless I... Oh, now I'd memorize all my lies, so I went on and I told him uh, the name of the, my commander was Colonel whatever I'd made up and the name of the base I was at and the airplane I was flying. And I told him I was flying F-105 and that I was all alone. There was <clears throat> no one else with me. And so far they, they seemed to be buying my story and they asked me again. And another guy came in and asked me the same questions. So at least I was getting the same lies I was repeating them. The third, the fourth, or the fifth day, I started losing consciousness. I kept passing out. And the guard would come in and slap me around and I would wake up. And Shaky, my interrogator, came in and says, you see, you have allowed yourself to, again, it's my fault for, so they gave me some water and a few guards came in and very surprised and they had a door just a wooden door and they laid it down beside me and they told me to get on it oh, I couldn't move I could not even begin so the guards picked me up top half bottom half put me on the door and the door was my stretcher so four or five guards came in picked up this door and they walked me out in the hallway and went right out the main door the Hanover Hilton I just come in two days to six days earlier I had totally lost track of time but I do know when I went out the door this time it was night it was dark and they put me in the back of a another small van type vehicle and drove away and it wasn't very much long of a drive five minutes ten minutes bouncing through a very un unprepared, unsmooth streets, and I ended up, same guards took me out, walked me in. I remember some of the guys at the other end of the door were wearing white smocks, as, as you would see in a, a hospital setting. So they took me in, they laid the door on a bed, and pretty soon a bunch of several doctor-looking people came up, and they were talking a bit at me, so I had no idea what they were saying. But they put up a little a rag or something so I couldn't see what was going on between my, my head and my right arm. But I could see the flopping that they were unwrapping this long rag bandage. And I kept looking over there. And as the bandage came off, I did get a glimpse of my arm and the big swollen mass that I thought I was going to see wasn't really as bad as I thought. It was mainly just dried blood. So they began clean, cleaning the wound and, and, uh, and I got the odd glimpse and I saw a guy take a pair of like big tweezers and there was a, a piece of white bone that was a splinter and they grabbed it and they pulled it out it was kind of like the white thing you see in a bird cage that they let birds peck on. So obviously when this bone had been shattered, it had splintered off a little piece, maybe an inch and a half long. And I remember the guy pulling it out and looking at it, and they just discarded it. So that's why I've always, even years later when I heal, I've always had this dip. There's a chunk of the, the bone that's missing. So when you heal, there's quite a dip in it. And they, they I, I saw them, it looked like a big salt shaker. They, oh, actually, they, they cleaned it and it looked like a salt shaker, but they must have been shaking, I'm guessing, sulfur powder, because nobody, none of the medics or doctors or whatever they were ever spoke a word of English to me. They shook this white powder on it and, and put a, <clears throat> a, a, a gauze and wrapped it up, a band-aid, and, and then they put some some splints on my arm and held it straight, and 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 then they they put a cast on it. It was a very and I remember they wrapped the, the this material around it. And it was flexible, but in a, just a very few seconds it it hardened, and so it's some kind of stuff I guess when it's wet it's 
pliable. And anyway, the next thing I knew, I had a cast from about here to here. It was that thick. It was a giant thing. And so when my hand was up to here, was in a cast up to here, so I had no way of moving this, but I was just hoping, was hoping there was no infection under there. So they moved my arm here, laid it on here, told me to get up. I couldn't move. I was still on the door. They picked me up, took me out the door, put me back in the same vehicle, I think. We took off. This drive, I thought maybe I was going back to the same place, the Hanoi Hilton, but I wasn't. So I went in this vehicle for at least a half hour. I have no recollection of time. Went in a obviously a different camp. The gate opened, I heard it creaking. Drove in, jabbering. Bunch of new bunch of guards came, opened the door, and they carried me out of the door a long ways, like down a hallway and down a hallway. And finally they opened a creaky door, took me on the, and I was in a pretty big cell. It had three bunks, I guess you'd call them, just slabs of of wood, one, two, three. And I, they just laid me on it, sort of pushed me off the door. And here I'm laying in the slab, and I don't have any idea where I am, but now I know where I was. I was in cell six of the cell block in the zoo called the stable. So I had been moved from the Hanoi Hilton to the hospital to the zoo, the POW nickname for this second biggest camp in Hanoi. And later I found out that the cell I was in was cell six of the stable. And I they plopped me on the bed, walked out, door clanged, I heard the door bolt go in and lock, and next thing I knew I was unconscious. I passed out from exhaustion and slept. I have no idea how long I slept. <clears throat> next thing I know there's somebody gibbering at me and I open my eyes and there's a guard there and they oh <coughs> I woke up, this guy didn't speak any English, but he pointed to a few things. He pointed to a bucket, he said, Bow! Uh, and just like a little bucket, about that big around, about that high, the lid on, a steel handle. He said, Bow! B O. No idea what that means. I know now that the word bow means toilet. So that was my toilet. And he. Uh, there was a mosquito net for the bed wrapped up on it, and he took it out and shook it out and said, and he gave me the, you know, the, he's talking to me in sign language. This is to keep the mosquitoes out. And I realized I'd been laying there for however long. I'd been bitten about 80 times. So I was thinking, I, think I was going to be soon be very happy to have that mosquito net. So anyway, there I was in my new home. I was in cell six of the stable. And I had no clue at that time that I was in the zoo. But the next day I heard, I heard obviously Americans whispering to each other, out walking by. And the guard opened the door and came in and I was so dehydrated I, hadn't, I had not peed in that bucket. So he took the bucket out and put it outside. And these guys obviously were the latrine detail to pick up the bucket, go empty it. And a little later, there was another bucket there, but still. And the guard brought it back in, put it by the wall, because I, I still was not capable of getting up and walking around. Same guard, a little later, brought in some food. A little plate of rice, a little green tin bowl of soup. And he just said, eat, eat. And, and, and a, a metal spoon. So I tried my best with my left hand to scoop up a little bit of that. And I just remember two sips of that ghastly cabbage looking soup and I was about to puke my guts out. So I just, I couldn't do that. I ate a few sips of uh, spoonfuls of rice and laid back down and went unconscious again. Guard came back in a little later to pick up my dish and take it away and scolded me for not eating my generous portion of rice and soup. 
same guard came in later that afternoon before it got dark and tied up my mosquito net for me because I was just covered with mosquito bites. And they were just, as soon as, the, as soon as the sun started going down, they would just come in the little holes uh, in the <coughs> walls. There were no windows, there were just small holes. There was a, had a window, but it was covered with a bamboo mat. But the mosquitoes, as soon as the sun started going down, became very hungry and vicious. So anyway, the guard tied up. There was a place to tie the four places of the net. I crawled under the net, scooted my butt in there, and tried to flush those mosquitoes that got in there with me out and slept like a dead body that first night, and maybe the second day, and maybe the third day, I don't know how long, but I was in and out of consciousness just from pure exhaustion. I am guessing now the third or fourth day, I was strong enough to get up and stumble over to my bow, take the lid off and pee in it, and put the lid back on. And I, I, I still had nothing to wear. The only thing I had, my, the only garb I had was my underwear from when, when I was captured. <clears throat> so it was the third or fourth day the same guard came in who had brought me my food and had brought me my bucket and laid my new prison ward, wardrobe on the plank beside me. And what I had was a pair of shorts with maroon and gray stripes. Two pairs of shorts, one long shirt, long sleeve, uh, one short sleeve shirt, which was black. And it was just, it was made, it was just straight. There was no curves, it was just a, a prison shirt. It had a neck, maybe split down to here, no buttons or anything, and just that was your short sleeve shirt. And the short pants, and then a long sleeve shirt with maroon stripes and gray stripes and long pants that matched the maroon and gray stripes that went there. It was hot. It was September. It was still September, so it was still very hot in Vietnam. So I never put on the long sleeves or the long pants for the first period of time I was there. It was too hot. So the, anyway, week goes by, I guess. I'm getting a little stronger. I'm learning to drink some of this god-awful cabbage soup that they brought and eat a bit of the rice knowing. You gotta eat something or you'll, you'll die. So even if it was ghastly tasting, I was able to swill and the water. They gave me a little tea, a little teacup about that big and the, the guard would bring it in because I still wasn't walking and he would bring my little teapot of water, and it was a cup. So I'd pour a cup of water and drink, and I, I was just dying of thirst. So every time they brought me water, I would chug a lug a, a cup of water, and then and I always finished the entire teapot. And later in the day, I heard a female voice. Bam, there was a little peephole in the, in the main door. And she opened the door, and I saw this little set of girl eyes out there. And she said, Nook, Nook. I had no idea what Nook, Nook meant. And I got up, and I looked at her, and Nook, Nook. And she was sort of banging. She had a teapot in her hands. Ah, obviously, she's the water lady. So I took my empty teapot over to her, and I put the teapot, the little peephole that opened up laid flat when it was down. I put my teapot on it and I watched her. She took it. She, they had a great giant two tin pots of very hot water and she took a big scoop, filled it up, put it back. I put it in my hand, bam, she slammed the door in my face. The little door, and that was the nook girl. Nook, obviously, turns out to be the Vietnamese word for water. Day seven to day 10, somewhere along in there. I'm, this, my routine now is getting more of a routine. Waking up, I remember hearing very early in the morning, just at daylight, somebody banging on an old artillery shell. 
Bang, 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 bang. That meant get up. Time to wake up. But they weren't paying much attention to me because I just ignored it. <clears throat> Stayed under my mosquito net as long as possible. The guard would bring my little bowl of soup and rice sometime in the morning. He would bring it in. He would take it out. The nook girl would come and change my water. I'm thinking midday. Five o'clock or so in the afternoon, the same guard would bring me in rice and a, another bowl of soup. 20 minutes later, he'd come in and take away the dishes. <clears throat> After about a week or so, the guard came in with another guy who spoke a bit of English and said, started giving me, now that I'm getting ambulatory, the guard's not bringing me my rice anymore. When he opens the door and said, I forget what he said, eat, eat, in English. I was to get up, walk outside the cell door, turn left a bit, and there was a kind of a two saw horses with a door on it, and five dishes of rice and five bowls of soup. So I would walk out there, and since I have a broken right arm and it's in kind of a, a, a rudimentary sling around my neck, I grab the bowl of rice, and I walk back in, set the bowl of rice, walk back out, get the bowl of soup, and they shut the door. I know I've got time to eat it. The guy guard opens a little peephole. I hand him the, the two dishes. He takes them away. So the routine is... Just that for I'm a week, maybe. I'm in that cell. That's all I do. Get water, get rice, get cabbage soup, and sleep. In the second week or so, the door opens, and in comes a Vietnamese English-speaking officer. I'm not, I just don't remember which one it was, but his English was good enough, he says. I stood up, and he had his, his guard behind me, and he said, bow. I don't know what this word means. Bow. And I said, bow? He says, bow. So I, I said, I don't know what bow means. I soon found out, whack in the back of the head. The guard pushed me over. It means bow. I says, no. Bad mistake. <laughs> Bad mistake. Guard knocked me on the floor and gave me a fairly good little thrashing with his fists and his feet. And the, and the English-speaking guy stood there, stood me up, said, bow. I bowed. A little baby bow. Not good enough. Whack in the back of the head. So I bowed. And little did I know that the bow routine, not only when you see an English speaking officer, when you encounter any Vietnamese in the prison camp, be it the nook girl who opens your window, you bow. The guard comes in to take you out to get your rice. You bow. If you're, anytime you approach, it, it took a few ass kickings to get this in my little head, but after a while it was so routine I didn't even think about it. I was hoping, I says, I hope these, all these other American guys who I knew were around, because I, I knew that I could see other dishes of food. I was wondering, God, I wonder if I'm the only chicken shit in this outfit is bound to these dickheads. But anyway, it turned out everybody was. Because if you didn't, they beat the hell out of him. If you just continued not to, they'd, they could kill you. So, and I'm in the prison routine now. I've been there, what, two weeks. I'm walking good enough to get my own food and pick up my water, bow every time somebody comes in. <clears throat> I still have not spoken other than this one guy who, oh, I forgot one thing. When this English-speaking guy came in, he motioned me up to the cell door, and on the back of the cell door, 
was it in printing 12 the camp rules in English in 12 camp rules and they were very bad English but you could understand them and I forget what they all were but rule number one the prisoners shall make no noise in their room they called they didn't call themselves they called them room it is the prisoners will not try attempt to communicate with prisoners in any other room the prisoners shall greet the Vietnamese according to the rules of the camp policy, which meant bow every time you ran into one, and a bunch of other stuff which I can't recall, but in some of my, the prisoners will answer any question given by the camp authority completely and truthfully. So that was the camp rules. I was looking at that and thinking, oh, you know, this place ain't growing on me. Week two, week three, maybe, I don't know, time goes by. I, was, I remember I would sleep constantly. I was so exhausted. I would sleep all night and all day except when the door was open and somebody would give me something to eat or, <clears throat> or something, or some water. A couple of weeks go by, door opens, and a new guard I've never seen, he gives me this signal. I had no idea what this meant. So he came in and took my, I still have a broken arm, took my long pants with the maroon stripe and the gray stripe. I'm barefooted, I got no shoes. I stepped into the pants and he had the time. I have a, you know, this arm is totally useless and I don't know anybody I know can, there was a drawstring so he tied a little knot and he slipped the long sleeve shirt on and it, that couldn't go on here because I guess, but he went in my left arm, went in and he draped over and the guy buttoned up my buttons for me, gave me the follow me signal. I walk out the door and I, first time I've been outside of my cell, so I walk along in front of it. So then I knew I counted the doors to the left of me. One, two, three, four, five. So obviously I was in the sixth and end room. I go by this place, turn right, and I forget exactly the, I could show you if I had a map of thing, walk between. And there was other, other buildings, cell blocks, but there was bamboo fences between, not, not to, fence wouldn't stop anything, but so you could not see from, when you're walking down the, beside this cell block, there's a bamboo fence here so you can see there in case there was some other prisoner I guess or to prevent you from communicating in any way with the other prisoners. But anyway I'm not too coherent what's going on here because I'm still in the, uh, suffering from bad infection and exhaustion. They take me up to headquarters and they take me in a room and there's a little green cross on the door. You know we have red crosses. The medic has a green cross. So they take me in and sit down there and there's a medic and guy, I know medic, hell, he's got a dirtiest white smock on I've ever seen. <coughs> and he's, he told me to move your fingers and the cast goes to here so I could barely move them, but you know, they move a little bit and he's wiggling them around, wiggling them around, wiggling them around, wiggling them around. I had an open wound in my right leg because the shrapnel that went in here and came out here stuck in here. So this hole was about that deep as a puncture wound. And it had developed a bunch of pus, little pus hole, drain holes around it. So he, this guy just took his thumbs and squeezed like hell in his little pus hole and choo, the white pus would come out. Oh. He, he did that, these holes around there, and squish, 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 and scoot and puss out of there. And he took some tweezers, was pulling the dried blood and stuff off the top, and reached way down in. The, I didn't know it then, but puncture holes heal from the bottom up. They don't heal over like that. They heal from the bottom up. This wound took more than a year to, to completely heal up, but this guy just was pulling chunks of dried blood and out and squeezing these pus holes around it. Shook some powder on there like sulfa powder. There was a couple other wounds, smaller wounds. He looked at those. They, they were just minor things. 
that was it. Went back to myself. And so from then on, twice a week or thereabouts, I would go see this guy and he would have me move my fingers and, and, and work on this thing. Cause it, it, it took a long time, it took almost a year for that open wound to heal. But at least they were doing something. They gave me something and I obviously didn't get infection and I didn't die or I didn't get gangrene in my leg or arm fall off. Back to the thing, a couple of days more. A couple of days later, another guy shows up. Oh, there's a mouse. I'm serious, there's a mouse right there. Just like being in a cell in Vietnam. Except we had rats that big. Anyway, another, another guy comes, opens the door, gives me the, you know, now I know the signal, that means, so I get up, put on my pants as best I can, he ties the knot, I drape my thing. And this is a big day in the life of Spike Naismith in a prison camp. I'm about to meet my first, or actually my second English-speaking interrogator, but my first meeting with an English-speaking interrogator in the zoo. Little did I know, the building I was about to walk into was the, was the, the office that was operated by a English-speaking interrogator that had been nicknamed, not by me, but by other prisoners. Of course, I didn't know it that at that time because I had communicated with nobody. I was about to meet Dum Dum. Dum Dum earned his name because Dum Dum was the, one of the dumbest SOBs that God ever created. <laughs> so anyway, the guard he comes to the door, goes in there, he's got he's carrying a rifle, and he blah 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 shouts at the something and he, he is answered by in, in Vietnamese. Obviously they said, I've got prisoner nah shit here. Bring him in. So I go in there and sitting behind this desk is this beady eyed little look like a demented rat. Had his little Vietnamese hat on, it was off the crook a little bit, his eyes were very close together. <clears throat> and he tried his best to look as ferocious as he could, but he couldn't have weighed 112 pounds. But I could tell by looking that there's something really wrong with this guy. There's, he didn't get his fair share of brains when God put him together. But anyway, he was an English-speaking interrogator, and he shouted at me, Nah, shit! Naismith comes out, Nah, shit! Shit down! So I'm, I'm, you know, here I am. I'm scared to death. I've been a prisoner of war in North Vietnam for a month. I've been tortured. I've been in a medical place. I've... I'm peeing in, in a bucket. I'm eating the most awful garbage in the world. And this guy calls me nah shit and he tells me to shit down. So, uh, anyway, uh, it's not very funny. It is a very bad situation, but I damn near laughed. So there was a chair and I sat down. And he started shouting and yelling at me and, and I, I didn't understand a word he said. And I... And I said, I don't understand. So he, 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 he says, eventually he showed me a copy of the camp regulations. You read camp regulations? I said, yes. You obey? I said, okay. So he, he, he put that down and he says, <clears throat> he was some other things. He says, you must confess to your crimes. And, and, and I had a hard time understanding because this guy's English was really bad. I said, I don't understand. Whack! The guard behind me hit me the side of the head. He'd obviously given him some kind of signal. Whack this turd. He's not, he's not doing what I said. So I said, okay. He says, you don't say okay to me. You say, yes, sir. Whack! Another belt in the head. I said, yes, sir. So... He, he was asking me a bunch of questions about this, and I said, I don't understand. I don't understand what you say. I, I, I said, look, I have bad, I have terrible headache. I have to go diarrhea. Can I go back to my room? He says, no. 
He says, you blah, blah, blah. He was getting madder and madder and he was, he was getting redder and he finally he shouted at me, nah, shit, I will have you killed. And that can be very dangerous for you. And here I am, dying of infection, starving to death in a Vietnamese prison camp, never sure what I'm going to end. When he said that, I couldn't contain myself. I, I, I did a goof all out. <laughs> I think some snot squirted out my nose and I tried to cover up my what this guy had just said. I said, how could anybody say that? That's the funniest. So anyway, I pull. He looked at me. He said, why you laugh? Why you laugh? No laugh. He said, I will have you killed. That could be very dangerous for you. And then I, I pull. Whack, bang, smack, guards kicking the hell out of me. Jesus, I didn't know what I'd done wrong. But anyway, I finally got my composure. I, and this guy was so furious, and the guard is slapping me around, and he said, Nah, shit, return your cell. You must learn to think clearly. So I, I get up, I turn I start to turn around, block. He says, Bow, bow. So I, now I learn you got to bow when you see him, and bow when you leave him. I give my little bow and turn around and walk out the door back to my cell. I think, Holy Christ. How could anybody survive this thing? You know, these people are nuts. So anyway, I did my best to never, never get a laugh again because it really caused me a thrashing. So I go, the guy takes me back, puts me in the thing, I bow when he leaves, and I can undress with one hand. I pull the thing, I take off my long pants, <coughs> take off my <coughs> shirt, throw it on the bed, crawl under the mosquito net and try and recover from my first meeting with Dum Dum. Take a short break? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll probably change that. That was fun.